Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the third and final day of our webinar. Uh, I'm immensely glad to introduce today my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Aparna Nanda. Uh, Dr. Aparna is currently working as an assistant professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Rupa. Uh, she is the recipient of University Gold Medal for graduate and postgraduate examinations conducted by the Fordichel University in 2009 and 2011. She completed her PhD from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences for the uh, Institute of Technology in Madras on the broad topic of postmodern fiction. Some of her research interests include historiographic metafiction, war novels, peace narratives, and post-colonial fiction. Uh, welcome, Aparna, and the stage is all yours. Thank you, Dr. Swati, for those kind words of introduction. It's always a pleasure to speak to motivated scholars and students. So the topic uh, for uh, today's topic for discussion is historiographic metafiction and reading crisis through the lens of fiction. But before we go into the topic, let me introduce uh, what is history, what is historiography, and then we will go into the concept of historiographic metafiction. So without much ado, let us start the discussion. What is history? History now often simplistically it is defined as a knowledge of the past. But this is a rather simplistic definition. Yet let us take a moment and problematize this definition. This past, what you call as the past, is often treated as a monolithic and unilateral entity. For example, when we when we re, uh, when we read the histories of King Ashoka or perhaps any Mughal Empire, we get only one perspective of history, and most likely it is the king's perspective. So we don't get the perspective of the courtiers, we don't get the perspective of the opponent team, we don't get the perspective of the commoners. We don't get these perspectives. Most often, history is written from the uh, point of view of, of the king. And George Orwell rightly says that history is often written from the perspective of the winner. So it is the winner's history that we, are, uh, we, uh, we get to read. So the point is that history may not consider the sources of knowledge, the varied sources of knowledge that we have access to. So the domain of history takes a more product-oriented approach to knowledge. It is not uh, considerate of the processes that, that go into the construction of history. Instead, it is more uh, concerned about the product in itself. In order to problematize this view, let us investigate the nature of truth and the nature of knowledge in itself with a very popular example. So we are all, uh, we have all at some point or the other studied the present tense. And uh, when we learn or teach the present tense, we always say that the, the universal truths are expressed in present tense. So in the context of universal truth, we use this popular sentence, the sun rises in the east. This is a universal truth. This, sh this should be written in the present tense. Most of us, all of us, perhaps English uh, students have at some point or the other studied this particular sentence. But let us, in, let us take a moment and investigate this sentence. The sun rises in the east. Does it? Does the sun rise in the east? The sun rises in the east only if you are the center. So if you are the center and you are looking at the sun from your perspective, the sun goes up and down. So the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Right. But in reality, we go round and round the sun. So truth, what you call as truth, is, is reduced to a perspective. It is not a universal truth. If you are standing somewhere else, then this particular truth would not sound like the universal truth. And by extension, uh, history, knowledge, all these are reduced to perspectives, are reduced to opinions, are, do not claim, uh, do not have claim to say that it is the truth. Instead, it becomes a truth, one of the many truths that we have. Now, this is the domain of historiography. Historiography is a study of the perspectives of history. 
It changes a product-oriented approach towards history into a more process-oriented narrative. So, for example, uh, history would say that we have more men inventors, scientific inventions. In terms of scientific inventions, we have Edison, we have Newton, we have Tesla, we have, uh, we have, and we have one Madame Curie. So, majority of the scientific inventions are done by men. This is something that we have all noticed in our study of history. But historiography would not be content with that statement. Historiography would investigate. What are the conditions that, that made this kind of a truth, uh, that, that constructed such a kind of truth, such a kind of history? Did women have access to education at that particular point of time? What are the conditions under which women had uh, access to education? Did they have access to public spaces? Did they have uh, the same kind of, um, you know, egalitarian approach to education? Did the society recognize their education? Now, these are questions that historiography as a domain would ask. And these are pertinent questions. Now, simply put, historiography is the history of history. So it is showing you the process of construction of history. It shows light on, on how history is being made, how a, a, a particular a body of knowledge is being made, how a particular body of knowledge is being constructed. It shows the process of construction. It highlights the discourses that go into the process of construction. So this particular, by showing this uh, process of construction, it is also subverting the, the product-oriented approach towards history. Now, when we speak about historiography, we have to speak about two theoreticians. Now, the first one is E. H. Carr. E. H. Carr wrote the work, What is History? So his most popular work is What is History? Where he reflects on the nature of history itself. He says, uh, he gives a very uh, significant uh, example. He says that history um, is like fish on a fishmonger slab. So the fish is available to you. That is, the raw material is available to you. Now, the historian can cut up the fish and make whatever he wants to cook up. So he can cook up whatever he wants to do. So he is bringing the subjectivity of the historian in the process of construction of history. He's talking about uh, the, the important role played by the historian in, the, in, in producing the version of history that we have access to. So it is, it is the historian's subjectivity. It is not, it is not uh, the fact that he's writing. He has the raw materials, but what you, what you make out of it, what you construct out of it, is entirely dependent upon the subjectivity of the historian himself. So if the historian wants to make a particular dish, he can make a particular dish. He does not like that dish. He wants to make something else out of the fish that is the raw materials available to him. He can very well make those, those kind of uh, dishes. So the dish is up to him, but the raw materials are provided to him. Uh, to the historian. So this is the uh, main argument that E. H. Carr talks about in his work, What is History? Now, the second most important theorist, while we talk about historiography, is Hayden White. Hayden White talked about the work Meta History. Now, Meta means on history. So it is, uh, he's talking about the, he's reflecting on the nature of history. And he's saying history is not written uh, in formulas. History is not empirically uh, written. History is written in the form of narrative. And whatever is narrative does not have claim to uh, objectivity, does not have claim to authenticity. It is very subjective. And all narratives, for that matter, are subjective. So he's, he's tripping the domain of history uh, of the claim to, uh, claim to uh, veracity, claim to authenticity. And he's he establishing the subjectivity of history. And he's saying it's OK. That is OK. We can have many versions of history. All right. So um, now this, this particular argument of historiography is, is is brought into the fold of literature by theoretically brought into the fold of literature by Linda Hutchin. 
in her work, The Poetics of Postmodernism, which was published in the year 1988. So in The Poetics of uh, Postmodernism, uh, he, uh, Linda Hutchin is coming up with one particular subgenre of postmodern fiction, which is called historiographic metafiction. And Linda Hutchin argues that, uh, you know, he, she's arguing for postmodernism. There are always uh, theoreticians who attack postmodernism, saying that postmodernism is ahistorical, it is apolitical, it is aethical, because it does not take a standpoint. Linda Hutchin says, look at this particular subgenre of uh, historiographic metafiction, which is a subgenre of postmodern fiction. This is very much political. This is inherently political. This is inherently historical. This is inherently ethical. And she, she cites uh, these examples and she says, they, they write alternate histories. They subvert histories. They look at history, uh, particular errors, historical errors differently from different points of view, from different perspectives. They are reflective of their own fictionality. And thereby, they are able to, to, to subvert this particular idea of the truth in this particular subgenre of postmodern fiction, which is historiographic metafiction. Now, what we are going to do in this particular talk is I'm going to talk about one particular book, which is The Book Thief, uh, which is written by Marcus Zusak, Australian author Marcus Zusak. Now, this particular book was published in 2005. It became an international bestseller and was translated into 63 languages and sold millions of copies. It was an instantaneous success. It was made into a movie in the year 2013. I recommend the movie to you if you have not seen. However, for the sake of this talk, I would like to show the trailer of the movie so that you get a better understanding of, of um, of the uh, text that I'm talking about. So I'm going to share screen. Dr. Swati, could you please share the trailer? Are you sharing the screen? Yes, I'm sharing. Please let me know if it is uh, audible. My name is Liesl Memminger. I don't have a family or even a place to call home. I never understood the meaning of the word hope, but I'm about to meet the people who would change all that. Come. Meet your new parents. Your Majesty. From now on, you call me Mama, yeah? That lazy pig over there, you call him Papa. Your first book. Are you sure this is yours? It wasn't always mine. Can't you even read yet? Go on, read one word. I'm not such a good reader myself, you know. We will have to help each other out. I have something very important to tell you, Lisa. Who is he, Papa? His name is Max. He needs help. I need you to promise me that you will not tell anyone. Is that your book? It wasn't always mine. Mama! They're coming. They're checking basements. If anyone saw him, they would take you away from me. And they cannot tell you what they will do to him. Words will inspire her. If your eyes could speak. What would they say? Courage will guide her. You're hiding someone, aren't you? Can we trust her? She's a child. She's our daughter. Hope will define her. I can't lose someone else. You've kept me alive. Don't ever forget that. You're stealing books? Why? When life robs you, sometimes you have to rob it back. Our life reason. All those pages, they're for you to fill.
Okay, so you have seen the trailer. Let me give you a brief summary of that, uh, of this book. You Now you have an idea of, of, of the book that I'm going to talk about. So the book page is a story of Liesel Meminger. So this, the girl whom you saw in that particular trailer, the nine-year-old girl is Liesel Meminger. Liesel Meminger is a nine-year-old German girl who's given up by her mother. Uh, and goes to live with foster parents, Hans Huberman and Rosa Huberman, in the fictional town of Mulche in 1939, shortly before the World War II. So she's, she's given up by her parents for some reason, and she goes to live with foster parents. It is her life with foster parents that becomes the story of the book piece and what she does, what she, what she witnesses during the time of that political conflict just before the World War II. So the, there is a lot of tension in the air and uh, Liesel Meminger, you are seeing that tension from the perspective of a nine-year-old child. On the way to Molchen, Liesel's brother dies and she's traumatized. At the funeral, she steals a book from the gravedigger. That book is called The Gravedigger's Handbook. At this particular point of the story, Liesel does not know how to read. So she, she's fascinated by the world of books. So she steals this particular book, The Gravedigger's Handbook. She learns to read in this particular book. Hans, her foster father, to bring her comfort, teaches Liesel to read, starting with The Gravedigger's Handbook. Parallelly, she befriends uh, a neighborhood boy, Rudy Steiner, who falls in love with her. At this time in the text, life for Liesel is very com comfortable. She's, she's very happy in her life, despite what is going on in the, uh, in the neighborhood, despite what is going on in the larger political context. Uh, Liesel is extremely happy in her, in her foster home. Then one day, Liesel, Hans and Rudy go to a book burning organized by the Nazi regime. Because at that particular point of time, the act of reading, the act of writing, the act of, uh, you know, the act of having an intellectual conversation was was looked down upon, was, uh, you know, it had a condescending look because this instigated more violence. That was the perception of that uh, particular time. Then she realizes that her father was persecuted for being a communist and that her mother was likely killed by the Nazis for the same crime. After this realization, she tries to find consolation for her fears and sorrow in the written word. And she steals a book from the book burning gathering. So she, she went to the funeral, she stole a book. She went to the book burning gathering, there also she st steals a book. This act is witnessed by the mayor's wife, Ilsa Herman, who later invites Liesel to read in her library and thus begins a long and secret friendship. So this particular, this cute act of stealing a book from the book burning uh, ceremony is witnessed by the mayor's wife, Ilsa. And she, she calls Liesel and she says, why don't you come? I have a huge library. And and I will lend you books. You can read in my library. And she calls her home. And uh, now Liesel has access to education. Liesel has access to a world full of books. Along the same time, Hans and Rosa hide a Jew named Max in their basement. Liesel and Max become close friends. And Max writes Liesel two stories about their friendship, both of which are reproduced in the novel, not in the uh, movie, but in the novel. When Hans publicly gives bread to an old Jew being sent to a concentration camp, Max is forced to leave and Hans is drafted into the military at a time where air raids over major German cities were escalating in terms of frequency and fatality. So at this particular juncture, there is a very, very poignant line in the, in the, in the movie. So um, uh, um, uh, the father, Hans, uh, does something, okay? He, he, he gives bread to a person who is being taken away, who, for a Jew who is being taken away. And uh, they know that now Max has to go, the Jew who's hiding in their house has to go, and uh, Hans is being drafted off to the military. So Liesel is crying in the basement, and he's, he's, he's telling her problems to Max uh, in, the, in the basement. And uh, Max says, you know, what is the problem? What is the mistake that uh, my father did? This is the question that Liesel asks. And the Jew says, you know, he reminded people of their humanity. He reminded people that they are humane. He reminded them of their values. And that is a crime during the World War 
uh, time. So that is that is a very very interesting line. I thought you might find it interesting. Lisa next sees Max being marched towards the concentration camp. Lisa loses hope and begins to disdain the written word, having learned that Hitler's propaganda is to blame for the war and the Holocaust and the death of a biological family. But Ilsa encourages her to write. So the mayor's wife, who lends books to uh, books to uh, Lisa, the central character, uh, encourages her to write even during uh, one of the toughest times. Uh, in uh, Liesel's life, and Liesel does write. Liesel writes the story of her life in the Huberman's basement, where she miraculously survives an air raid that kills Hans, Rosa, uh, Rudy, and everyone else on the block. Liesel survives the war, as does Max. She goes on to live a long life and dies at an old age. Now, this is the summary of the work. Now, this work raises many questions. One of the first things that you notice about this text is the narrative. And this is the aspect that has garnered a large amount of critical attention and the thing that sets the story apart, because this story has two narratives. One is obviously is Liesel. You are, you are seeing things from the perspective of Liesel. But the most important and the central narrator, narrator is personified death. So there is a death who's narrating the story. There is death who's telling the story of Holocaust. So you are seeing Holocaust, one of the darkest annals uh, in the history of the world, from the perspective of death himself. And this is not a death who is very brave and malicious and evil and cold and icy. It's not that kind of a death. It's a very fragile death, a death that is traumatized by what is happening around him. So you see the perspective of uh, what is happening around from the perspective of death. So Zizak's choice to represent the story through the eyes of personified death is unique. Instead of having death be something malicious and worthy of fear, death is instead frightened by humans and the terrible things that they do to each other. So death, death is frightened by human beings. So you see an inverse, uh, you know, the perspective being inversed. You see there is a there, there is a binary that is being reversed. And it is this binary, the reversal of the binary, that makes all the difference to the reader because it gives you a new perspective. It gives you a different perspective that you have not seen. And that makes all the difference. That is what historiographic fiction is all about. Zuzak actually struggled with his choice. He first wrote to the character of death to be enjoying his work. And then he realized that death must be exhausted from his eternal existence. You know, eternally you're killing people. Would you enjoy it? No. Death would be exhausted from his eternal existence and his job, very demanding job. He, he was to be afraid of humans because after all, he was there to see the obliteration we have perpetrated on each other throughout the ages and would now be telling the story uh, to prove to himself that humans are actually worth it. So here, his... The, the, uh, death is looked at as a witness to history. Death becomes a witness to history. And death is not a happy witness. Death is a sad witness. So he's telling the, the, the he's privy to one of the, you know, problematic errors. And he, 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 wit he writes only what he witnesses. But he writes it from a very traumatized, from a very mm, sad point of view. Now, death as a comical figure has been represented in many pieces of literature before, but the depth of humanity and the emotion in this narrator is what sets him apart from the rest of, of the literature. This death, this death is not the simple cold icy death. It is a death that embodies human values. It is a death who, who, who stands for humanity who seems to remind the people of humanity at, the, at that particular time where humanity was not, uh, you know, was, uh, was uh, going through a crisis. So this is, is something that uh, death, the personified death of uh, Marcus Zaks, the book thief, does. So generally, we look at human beings as humane and death as being indifferent. Death is someone who comes to take away our loved ones. Uh, so this is always, death is always icy. 
Here you see an entirely different picture. You see death as being humane and tormented by the cruel acts of men, but human beings, on the other hand, become perpetrators of uh, evil and inhumanity. So this changes the way in which the reader perceives the story. So oh, uh, I want to give, uh, give you a perspective of the narrative of death. And so I'll show you the first section of the introduction of the character of death. And you can um, see for yourselves. So let's discuss the introduction. Uh, Dr. Swati, I'm going to share the screen. Is it visible? I hope it is visible. Not yet. It's not visible. OK. OK, is it visible now? Yes. OK. Uh, so this is the beginning of the story. The, the story begins like this, death and chocolate. Now our character death is scared of, of, of seeing death itself, of seeing, of, of killing people. And so when he kills people, he sees colors instead. He does not look at human beings. He is not interested in the life of human beings. He rarely looks at human beings. So Liesel Meminger is one of the exceptions he makes and he follows the life of Liesel Meminger. And he sees Liesel Meminger only three times during the story. So the first is when her brother dies and it is at the funeral of the brother that uh, death follows Liesel Meminger. The, the second instance is when the air raid happens and it kills the foster parents of uh, Liesel Meminger. It is at that particular time that death sees uh, the character Liesel. The third and final time that death witnesses Liesel is when he comes for uh, the character of Liesel uh, herself. After she has lived a full life, after she has lived the life uh, 90 years old, when she has lived up to 90 years old and she's, uh, she's, she's finally going to die, it is at that juncture that he sees Liesel. So this is the, what we are going to see is the introduction of the story here. So this particular uh, episode is called death and chocolate so first the colors then the humans that's usually how i see things or at least how i try here is a small fact you are going to die i am in all truthfulness attempting to be cheerful about this whole topic though most people find themselves hindered in believing me no matter my protestations Please trust me. I most definitely can be cheerful. I can be amiable, agreeable, affable. That's all the A's. Just don't ask me to be nice. Nice has nothing to do with me. So here, death wants to appear boisterous. And therefore, he says, you know, I'm not a nice person and you are going to die. And I, I, you know, just don't ask me to be nice. I can be amiable, I can be agreeable, I can be affable. So he he's sounding boisterous. He wants to show off that I am an icy person, I am a bad person. This is something that death wants to show, uh, death wants to demonstrate. However, just after that, there is a reaction to the aforementioned fact. Does this worry you? I urge you, don't be afraid. I am nothing if not fair. So. Just after his declaration that he's not nice, there is a there is a retraction of the statement that he says, what I said about myself. Now, does that worry people? Does it worry humans? No, I urge you now, do not be afraid of the person that I am. I may not be a nice person, but I am a fair person. So this, this, this contradiction is always uh, there in the narrative of death. While he wants to sound boisterous, while he wants to sound malicious, while he wants to sound evil, he is not, he does, he is not that kind of a person. He is kind and considerate. And that seems to be the entire problem. And that seems to be the juxtaposition that the author goes for. Now, of course, an introduction, a, a beginning, where are my manners? So our, our narrator, the death, uh, is, is very... He's, a, he's very gentlemanly. So he's, he's asking myself, you know, where are my manners? I did not introduce myself. I could introduce myself properly, if, but it's not necessary. You will know me well enough and soon enough, depending on a diverse range of variables. It suffices to say that at some point in time, I will be standing over you as genially as possible. Your soul will be in my arms, 
A color will be perched on my shoulder. I will carry you gently away. At that moment, you will be lying there. I rarely find people standing up. You will be caked in your own body. There might be a discovery. A scream will dribble through the air. The only sound I will hear after that will be my own breathing and the sound of the smell of my footsteps. The question is, what color will everything be at that moment when I come for you? What will the sky be saying? Personally, I like a chocolate colored sky, dark, dark chocolate. People say it suits me. I do, however, try to enjoy every color I see, the whole spectrum, a billion or so flavors, none of them quite the same, and a sky to slowly suck on. It takes the edges of the stress. It takes the edge of the stress. It helps me relax. So this entire process he narrates of uh, his act of killing somebody, his act of killing people, and what we witness through his act of killing people, while he does notice people, he's more concerned about what color the sky will be. Uh, and he's, he, he's, he concedes that he likes chocolate color, dark, dark chocolate. Uh, people say that it suits me. So he also takes opinion. He's concerned about uh, his own looks. And uh, uh, however, I enjoy every color. So I'm, I'm a very you know fair person. I do enjoy every color. And it takes this 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 process of looking at colors this process of uh, distracting himself with colors he says takes the stress off him helps him relax which means that he's already stressed he's he's not relaxed he does not want to do this job he's he's not um, he's not happy killing people he's not happy being a witness to holocaust so this is the beginning of the story now, the, uh, the other segment that I want to uh, discuss uh, is, is, the, is the final ending of the story itself. Now, if you look at the, uh, the um, uh, you know, children's literature or any uh, literature that represents children, uh, that represents, uh, you know, small people in the text will generally have a uh, happy ending. So the ending of this particular text is also happy, but it is not happy in the conventional sense of being happy. It is, uh, it is a very complicated happy. Uh, it's a complicated uh, ending that we, uh, we have in this particular text. So I'll show you uh, the ending of the text. So this is the ending. This is the final chapter. The war is over. The peace is established. Peace is established. Uh, Lisa Meminga has lived a full life. She's 90 years old. At that particular point in her 90s, death is finally meeting her. Death is finally going um, for our character. Liesel Meminga. She's had, uh, she married. She has had children. She's had um, grandchildren. She has seen the entire spectrum of life. It is at this point when he goes to take down Liesel Meminga. This is the segment that we are going to read. So the handover man. Yes, I have seen a great many things in this world. I attend the greatest disasters and work for the greatest villains. So death is saying, you know, I have seen everything. I have been a witness of everything. I've seen disasters. I've seen villains. I have worked for villains, you know, and at this point of time, I'm going to meet somebody very special. I, I'm, I'm going to meet somebody who has distracted me. But then there are other moments. There is a multitude of stories, a mere handful, as I have previously suggested, that I allow to distract me as I work, just as colors do. I pick them up in the unluckiest, unlikeliest places, and I make sure to remember them as I go about my work. The Book Thief is one such story. When I traveled to Sydney and took Liesel away, I was finally able to do something I have been waiting on for a long time. I put her down and we walked along Anzac Avenue near the soccer field and I pulled a dusty black book from my pocket. So this is the book that Liesel wrote in the basement of uh, Hans and Rosa's home, in her foster parents' home, uh, where she survives that air raid, uh, where all other people were killed. The old woman was astonished. She shook, she took it in her hand and said, is this really it? I nodded. 
With great trepidation, she opened the book thief and turned the pages. I can't believe, even though the text had faded and she was able to read her words. The fingers of her soul touched the story that was written so long ago in Himmel Street basement. She sat down on the curb. I joined her. Did you read it? She asked. But she did not look at me. Her eyes were fixed to the words. I nodded many times. Could you understand it? At that point, there was a great pause. A few cars drove by each way. Their drivers were Hitlers and Hubermans and Maxes, Killers, Drillers and Steiners. So this, this also indicates the passing of time. Many people have gone. Hitlers have gone. Hubermans have gone. Maxes have gone. Killers have gone. Drillers have gone. You know, but death and uh, Liesel at this point do not have to rush through time, do not have to, you know, go through the process of this time that we are going through, linear time. I want to tell the book thief many things about beauty and brutality. But what could I tell her about those things that she she didn't already know? I want to explain that I'm, con I'm constantly overestimating and underestimating the human race, that rarely do I ever simply estimate it. I want to ask her how the same thing could be so ugly and so glorious and its words and stories so damning and brilliant. None of those things, however, came to my mouth. So death wants to, death is suffering. Death wants to ask, express so many things to Liesel Memminger, but he's unable to express his thoughts and feelings. All I was able to do was turn to Liesel Memminger and tell her the only truth I truly know. I said it to the book thief and I say it here now. This is the last note from your narrator. I'm haunted by human beings. So I'm haunted by the brutality, by, by the uh, brutality that human beings are capable of. I'm also haunted by the greater goodness that people are capable of. So the coexistence of brutality and the coexistence of goodness in people is what haunts our narrator. And that is death. And this is something that I'm sorry. Okay, I've stopped sharing, I believe. Um, okay. So this is something that uh, the book discusses in great detail. And there are so many articles about this particular book uh, that, uh, that talks about this particular book from different directions. Now, let me cite one particular uh, article, which does not talk about this book, but talks about uh, an idea that this book uh, talks about. So the article is written by Zuzana Burakova. And this article is titled, Whose Trauma Is It? So this particular article talks about uh, another Holocaust fiction, third generation Holocaust fiction called um, Everything is Illuminated. So in Everything is Illuminated, it tells the story of a quest, tells the story of the grandson of a survivor of Holocaust. He goes to Ukraine to look for the lady who is supposed to have uh, saved his grandfather during the Holocaust. So that speaks about a quest. And in that quest, um, there is another person who is privy to this quest, that is the tour guide. So there is another grandson and there is uh, a grandfather who travels uh, with this particular person who has come to uh, look for this uh, Augustine who has saved uh, the, his grandfather. So in this quest, we realize that the tour guide, the grandfather who's a tour guide, happens to be one of the perpetrators of, of, uh, of, of, of a crime during a Holocaust. So in, he narrates this at towards the end of the story. So this is a spoiler alert. So uh, he says that uh, at the, uh, when, when he lived in a village, the Nazi people came and uh, they asked everyone to come out of the village. And everyone was supposed to point to the nearest Jew. And there came a point where there was only one Jew in the group, and that was the grandfather's friend, Herschel. And the grandfather, in order to save his family, in order to save his child, in order to save his wife, points to the nearest Jew, that is his friend. So he betrays his own friend. This traumatizes him. And he goes to live uh, in, a, in a different town. He relocates to a different town. He strips himself of his identity. He, he does everything possible. But still, even towards the end of his life, 
this this particular uh, this particular act of betrayal haunts him so he says it did not just happen to a particular bu- bunch of people it happened to all of us because we were also stripped of our humanity we were also privy to this we were also witness to this so if you are interested in following this uh, trajectory of thought you could perhaps read that uh, thing so with this i will try and conclude my talk without taking much time so okay so that's the act of writing novels that focuses on various aspects of the challenging time not only highlights the micro historical and political realities of the country but also speaks about acts of love acceptance and concern as a means of resisting power so one of the biggest aspects of resisting power is is by, is through acts of concern is through acts of kindness is through acts of acceptance accepting the difference the novelist act of representing war in all its coarseness is an attempt is an attempt to sensitize the readers uh, to the truth of violence writing such novels is this is a political response and a testimony to the importance of art that engages with history and politics in the face of war with this i conclude thank you so thank you abana uh, can we take a few questions now yes this is from shashikala yes do you think it also manipulates history in favor of the author yes it does so whatever the author says but one of the things that you have to notice about this particular point is that it uh, it brings various perspectives so you can write about holocaust in a favorable light you can write about holocaust from different points of view and therefore there is multiplicity of points of view in relation to this particular story uh, am i audible yes you are yes okay so in relation to this particular story uh, in this uh, sorry in this question in relation to this particular question you can watch a ted talk by chimamanda nyogi adichie where he, she uh, talks about the importance of multiple stories she says that when you acknowledge multiple stories about a particular period about a particular person you are resisting the act of stereotyping so it definitely the author has a significant part to play in the story that he narrates obviously it is the author sense uh, subjectivity that comes uh, to the fore uh, but uh, it is several authors uh um subjectivity that comes to the fore i have taken one particular text but there are several texts that addresses different aspects of different uh, errors uh, and uh, i think that is very important it it resists stereotyping it resists uh, monopoly or unilateral uh, way of looking at a particular error thank you so the second question is from anandita okay this is a very interesting question or the last question was also very interesting so there is an increasing presence of holocaust distortion and denial what role can fiction play in countering such narratives see as i told you in my conclusion one of the um, most what i personally believe this is not a universal fact or anything so fiction sensitizes the readers when you read a newspaper okay and so many people you are reading newspaper about you know so many you know, theft uh, killing violence all that you are reading numbers you are not sitting and crying after reading newspaper right but fiction when you read you are reading one particular persons you are following one particular persons story thoroughly and you are you are going through the emotion you this caters to the emotional aspect of your being and therefore it sensitizes the readers it sensitizes the readers to 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 violence to aspects that that particular fiction uh, discusses and it i think it is very important to sensitize the readers to to acts of violence to acts of uh, you know any any brutality and uh, any any act of brutality for that matter so in my opinion uh, 
it is it is sensitizing the reader that is one of the most important aspects of fiction that i find uh, about literature this third question is from pooja pooja how does one connect this genre with the current situation of human existence uh, what 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 is that i i'm not a very <laughs> with regard to okay with regard to to the covid uh, scenario okay you are talking about crisis generally historiographic metafiction uh, talks about history so history is generally archived so you speak about a particular past so this this particular genre might not be uh, very relevant to do uh present to representing present times but there is another genre that is very relevant to, to representing the present that is the political fiction political fiction can also be uh, come under the uh, broader wing of postmodern fiction and uh, that particular genre might be uh, very relevant to uh, to the covid scenario so if you are interested in in the current scenario then you must you must investigate political fiction uh, historiographic metafiction might not be very significant in that uh, in that aspect okay uh, this is the last question no? okay thank you very much what are the ways of highlighting the story of the oppressed people how can we know their version of story will it receive the same amount of importance okay um th this is also very um, interesting how can you tell the story of the oppressed uh, you can tell the story of the oppressed by only showing their perspective so they must you must uh, give them a space to speak you must give them a space to express themselves and only when you hear their perspective of the story can you uh, can you Uh, can you understand their problems so in with regard to problems it is mostly misunderstanding you have to understand their problems only then you can do something about uh, any section of people okay oppressed minority women any any kind of problems societal problems that you speak about you need a space to discuss you need to initiate discussions you need to initiate conversations about those people and this is something that uh, fiction does vehemently how can we how can we know their version of history knowing their version of history is again giving them a space to discuss so uh, giving them a sa safe space giving everyone in uh, irrespective of oppressed or uh, uh, not oppressed everyone uh, goes through their own problems their own way but giving them a space to to express themselves is very important in the society that we live in in the current society that we live in uh, i fervently believe in that and fiction is one way of expressing them it is not the only way of expressing them fiction is one way of expressing them will it receive the same amount of importance um i think this is something that we should not be bothered about uh, you, if you are going to uh, think that will people like my if if i am giving a talk and if i say will people like my talk will uh, they accept uh, what i'm saying then in that case i will only speak things that you like i will not speak my truth but what we are going to do is you have to give everyone the, uh, a space to express their truth it is it need not necessarily be the truth it need not be the uh, majoritarian truth but uh, one of the ways in which you can counter uh, oppression any form of oppression is by giving them a safe space to speak their truth thank you apna would you be willing to take one more question Sure. So this is from Parijit. Do you think whether there is a diluting presence of actual events in literary representations of historical crisis? History is a very, very huge um, domain. I do not know what you mean uh, by historical crisis. If you are talking about Indian crisis. 
uh, diluting presence of actual events. Uh, actual events only come in the background of literary representations. Generally, we go for fictional representations. But you can read up on the category of uh, what is true and what is real. Uh, if I cite a very popular example, in uh, Harry Potter, there is a line, just because it is happening in my head, does it mean that it is not real? Or Arundhati Roy also uh, voices the same uh, same kind of uh, uh, statement. Um, just because I'm happy in my dream, does it does that count? I'm obviously summarizing. Uh, so literary representations uh, need to be honest, but they need not represent uh, actual events as they are. They represent events in a fictional way. And uh, if, if there is some honesty in the way they speak about literary events, I think that will go a long way in terms of literature. But other, um, other domains, sociology, um, uh, journalism, all these, uh, all these arenas can actually, um, you know, contribute directly to representing actual events. So I am a little dubious about where literature stands in uh, that. I'm not very clear about the question. But however, uh, thank you for your wonderful question. Okay, thank you, Aparna. Then we can conclude this session. And uh, thank you. the next session is at two, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys, for being here.